This is Chris with Phoenix Gaming. Today we're going to do Let's Dive into Core Rules, the movement phase. The movement phase is actually the second phase that you interact with in the game, the first being the command phase. But I feel like the movement phase is generally where games can be won and lost most often. Uh, the movement phase is broken into two steps. You have the move unit step, which consists of your ability to move all of your units. And then the reinforcements step, which is when you bring units from off the table from strategic reserves or deep strike. After that, you go into the end movement phase. And then from the end movement phase, you move into the psychic phase. And then we're also going to talk about some extra movement phase interactions. In the move units step, each unit in your army can perform different they're not really actions, but they kind of interact like actions. They're different types of movement. Uh, they could do a normal move, which is when models in the unit move up to their M stat in inches. So if their M or movement is 6, they can move up to 6 inches. That's all that means. So they can move 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2 and a half, doesn't matter, as long as they don't go over whatever their movement stat is. Uh, they can advance, and then you roll a D6, add it to your movement stat. And then that becomes the movement stat of that unit for the rest of the current phase. What that means is, uh, again, if your movement's 6, you roll a d6, you roll a 5, 5 plus 6 is 11, your movement stat is now 11 for the rest of the phase. Uh, and that's it. Uh, you can remain stationary, and that applies to any models that did not move or models that cannot move. Uh, they count as having remained stationary. Uh, you can also do a fallback which is a, another, again, it's a move equal to your movement in inches or less. Uh, but while making a fallback move, you cannot, you can, sorry, you can move within engagement range of enemy models, but cannot end within engagement range of enemy models. Uh, if you do a fallback, you cannot declare a charge or a shoot in the same turn you fell back. You can also not manifest psychic powers in the same turn you fell back. Uh, but Titanic units may fall back and shoot and also manifest psychic powers in a turn that they fell back. Uh, some of them can also charge. That's a data sheet rule, but just being Titanic allows you to fall back and shoot and fall back and wizard. You cannot end within one inch of any enemy models when performing any of these movements outside of obviously remaining stationary. And that's because if you're already within an inch, you just stay within an inch. You can only get within an inch of enemy models through charging or other special interactions like a heroic intervention or a pile-in or whatever. But generally speaking, in the movement phase, there's no way to get within an inch of enemy models outside of falling back. Uh, interestingly, I never considered this until making this video you can do a fallback even though you're not engaged with enemy units. There's nothing in there that says you have to be within engagement range to do a fallback. It just says that you have to perform a fallback if you wish to move within engagement range. Uh, and that, that's a, I'm sure that's kind of one of those oversights. Maybe it's not, maybe that was intentional, but it does mean like in certain situations, you could be outside of engagement range use a fallback to move through engagement range of an enemy unit to get onto an objective that they might have been otherwise blocking off or bubble screening and so on. Uh, you know, so like if you have a 25 millimeter base model and your opponent has like 32s and they have spacing wide enough that you could actually move your models through that spacing, you could technically do a fallback move between those models. And as long as you don't end within engagement range, that's a legal move. So it's just a, an interaction that I just happened to see while I was making this video. And I thought, wow, that's, that's actually kind of funny and good to know. Uh, we're going to look at some of my awesome examples here. And then we're going to move on to the reinforcement step. Uh, and this is just an example of how to make a move. The black base is your starting position. The orange base is your ending position. And then the lines show you where you're measuring from. So you're always measuring from front edge to front edge. You're never measuring like from back edge to front edge. You're always just measuring from the same side of the base to the same side of the base. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just kind of put your tape measure to the edge of it, measure out, move the base where you need it to be. Uh, this would be an example of like how to move around a terrain feature in a legal way because you have to actually move your base around the feature. Your base can't go through the feature. Obviously, there's going to be 
exceptions, like things that are breachable your infantry can move through. But like in this example, we just got our old armor container from the last video. The black lines kind of show us where paths are going. And then the blue line just shows us that we are not passing through the terrain feature. So, you know, you're just measuring it in a way so that you can kind of maneuver your base around it. You don't get to just take the shortest route possible because you actually have to account for the terrain feature. So again, if you look at the black line, it's measured from the side and that's intentional. That's because we wanted to make sure we could clear that feature and then we measure front to front. You know, so we clear the feature, we measure front to front, the blue line shows that we're not clipping the feature at all and we're able to go around it. And that would be the proper way to measure to move around a feature. It's actually a lot easier than it sounds and once you get in the habit of it, it'll all work really smoothly, I promise. Uh, the reinforcement step, that's for units that are in strategic reserves or deep strike. Uh, a unit that comes from strategic reserves or deep strike, it cannot, and, and sorry, deep strike is just kind of like a colloquial term for um, like data sheet abilities that allow you to start off the table, uh, drop pods, def coptus, things of that nature. So it's, it's just any kind of like inherent uh, reserves rule. If you come from off the board, you can't make a normal move, advance, fall back, or remain stationary. So if you have a rule that lets you do anything other than that, you can use it, uh, interestingly. But you always count as having moved your full movement, regardless of any special rules or strats. And that was an FAQ that came out, and that was basically like, hey, look, if you came from off the table, you don't get to use the strat to count as remaining stationary. You, you just always count as if you moved that turn, period, end of discussion. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, units that are set up on the table are typically have to be nine inches away or more of enemy models. It's technically more than nine inches. This may vary by unit, like GSC has some interactions that allow them to be closer. But the general rule of thumb is nine inches away from enemy models. If it's strategic reserves, you have to be usually within six inches of a table edge. Any kind of other restrictions will be listed on the data sheet or whatever rule you're using. Um, keep in mind that even though it doesn't interact in this step, psychic powers that teleport also count as having come from reinforcements or reserves. So, you know, uh, the T-Sun's cult, you can teleport units, but if you teleport a unit, they count as if they came from reserves or reinforcements. And because of that, they can't make a normal move. So you can't to jump them and then warp time them uh, because they count as if they came from reinforcements because they came from off the table. So these are just things to keep in mind. Like I said, that's, that's outside the movement phase, but it's one of those where it's important to know your movement phase rules because they're going to interact in different phases. You, when you measure your nine inches, it's measured from your enemy model to the closest part of your model's base or hull. And, and that's pretty straightforward. You just, it's the shortest distance possible can't be greater than nine inches and that's as the crow flies it doesn't account for terrain or anything once you finish your reinforcement step you're going to go into the end of movement phase so it, it's this is where people get caught up because there's things that say they trigger or start at the end of the movement phase and to them like you can't stack them but they, they there's just like a mental block there they're just like no this doesn't interact this way yes it does uh, if you have multiple rules that start at the end of the movement phase, the player whose turn it is, who is interacting with those things, gets to decide what order they're done in. Uh, so technically, the reinforcement step says in the reinforcement step at the end of your movement phase, this model gets set up on the table. And then Banner says at the end of the movement phase, start this action. Because these two kind of happen effectively at the same time, I get to decide what order they happen in. So I can bring something out of Deep Strike and then I can do like Knockman Data with it or I can do Banners with it. Again, I, I have seen some people get tripped up by this because they don't think that's how it interacts, but it's 100% it's how it interacts. It's intentional. I promise you this is the way it's supposed to. And, and again, remember that the end of phase stuff technically triggers after the reinforcement step anyway. You know, it's it's move step reinforcement step end of phase and then once that's done like i said you move on to the psychic phase 
Uh, we're going to go over some extra stuff now, uh, things that interact in the movement phase that don't pertain to what we said. Uh, one of those is going to be moving over terrain. If the terrain feature is one inch or smaller, you get to just move over it as if it didn't exist. Uh, now, there's going to be some features that you can't end your movement on top of, and that's fine. But generally speaking, you just get to roll over that shit or march over it. It doesn't matter. Uh, obviously, there's there's breachable and other keywords that interact a little bit differently. But again, we're talking about the general overall rules. Uh, if the feature is more than one inch in height, you have to measure the vertical distance up and then the vertical distance down to move over that feature. And you cannot end your movement mid-climb. What that means is, let's say you have a movement of 10 inches, okay? And a feature, let's say it's a wall, a ruined wall, and you want to move your dreadnought over it. That is technically a legal move. Your dreadnought's going to have a 10-inch move in this example. I understand it's really high, but bear with me. You can technically move your dreadnought over that feature if it's a 4-inch wall. You measure 4 inches up, minus or plus 4 inches down is 8 inches. So you subtract 8 inches from 10. That gives you 2 inches of movement. So your base has to be able to clear that wall with two inches of movement. Uh, is it going to? Probably not. Not on a dreadnought because they have like 60 millimeter bases, which is close to uh, three inches, two and a half inches. So it's not going to clear it. But if the base were to be able to clear it, uh, let's say it's not a dreadnought. Let's say it's, uh, I don't know, something else. It doesn't matter. Uh, you know, or let's say it has a, a 14 inch movement. You could clear it. You get to just move up and over it. Doesn't matter how silly it seems. You get to do it. You know, so so things can move over terrain features as long as they have the movement for the model or the base to clear that feature. Flying lets you ignore all vertical distances when moving over features. So again, in that ex example, if you've got uh, wings of Sanguinius and you slap it on your librarian dreadnought, he now flies. You can now fly over the wall and ignore it completely. You don't have to account for the vertical distance when moving. You do still need to measure vertical distance for charge rolls, though, when charging, even if you have the fly keyword. Uh, and really, that stems from 8th edition Smash Captain players kind of abusing their jump pack units, having unfailable charges while they're sitting on top of 10-inch terrain features, uh, you know, so there's there's a lot of reasons for it. That's not the only reason for it, but that's the one that stands out to my head the most. Um, you know, so these are things to keep in mind. I know, again, the charge roll isn't in the movement phase, but it kind of correlates to movement rules. So I wanted to throw that in there real quick. Transports. Uh, if a unit is embarked inside the transport, that unit is removed from the table because it is not on the battlefield. It cannot interact with the game unless a specific rule says it can. You can't use, you cannot use stratagems on units inside transports because they're technically not on the table and not in the game. Uh, the U transport would move as a normal unit would, regardless of whether or not there is a unit embarked upon it. Obviously, certain transports might have different rules. Let's say you want to get that unit out of the transport. Before the transport moves, the units inside can disembark. When a unit disembarks, it has to be wholly within three inches of the transport and not within engagement range of an enemy model. So if I want to disembark a group of orc boys from a truck, I just need to get all 10 of my orc boys out and they have to be wholly within three inches of the truck. Once that happens, both the truck and the boys can now move independently. The boys, however, count as if they moved their full move characteristic, even if they didn't move and they never count as remaining stationary. That is a specific clause in that rule that says they never count as remaining stationary. And again, that goes back to the same reinforcements rule we just talked about. Once disembarked, both the transport and disembarked unit may move normally, which we just covered. Now, let's say you have a unit that's not in a transport and you want to get it back into a transport. If a unit makes a normal move and advance or falls back, it can get into or embark on a transport, as long as that unit is wholly within three inches of the transport at the end of that movement. 
Now, obviously, you you can remain stationary, quote unquote, and still do it as long as you're wholly within. I don't think that interaction really matters a whole lot. Like, arguably, you could just say, I'm going to make a normal move of half an inch, and then I'm just going to get inside the transport just to fulfill the rule qualifier. But generally speaking, you just have to have the whole unit within three inches, and they have to have made a move, advance, or fall back. The reason those are important is because you can embark in different phases outside of the movement phase. Um, I believe, uh, what's the the pistol guy, the GSC, the Keller Morph? You know, you can... You can shoot and then move with the Keller Morph, and he counts as having made a normal move. And because he counts as having made a normal move, you can shoot, you can normal move, and then you can hop him back into the transport in the shooting phase. And you cannot embark if you disembarked in the same phase. So once you're out of the transport, you're out of the transport for the rest of the phase. But again, going back to the Keller Morph, you can hop him out, you can give someone the Blicky, and then you can just jump right back in because you're doing it in separate phases. Uh, if the transport hasn't moved, it can move once the embarked unit is on it. So if we, again, go back to our orc truck, if I have an orc truck, I can put 10 boys inside of it as long as they end their movement wholly within three inches of it. They can then get in the truck, which means the whole unit's just removed from the table. Typically, I just put one of my orc boys in the back of the truck as a reminder for both me and my opponent that I have a model or unit in there. And then if that truck hasn't moved, it can move as if normal. Uh, if, if it already has moved, it doesn't get to. So you can't move it even half of its distance, then get boys in, then move it again. It's, if it's already moved, it's done moving. If it hasn't already moved, then it gets to move. Uh, units with a minimum movement. This is generally going to be aircraft, but there might be some non-aircraft movements or units. Uh, if they can't move their minimum movement distance, they, they're destroyed. So if you have a minimum move of 10 inches, you have to move 10 inches every turn. You can never remain stationary. And if there's a reason that you can't move 10 inches, you just are destroyed. That's it. If it's an aircraft and that movement would take you off of a table edge, it's instead placed into strategic reserves. And that's a big improvement from 8th edition. So 8th ed, if it, if it went off the table, that's it. It was dead. If any part of the model overhung the edge of the table, it was dead. It was a really stupid interaction in the game. And they did a really good job to fix that. Um, and now it's if it flies off the edge, it just goes into strategic reserves and comes back in your next movement phase. Uh, hopefully this really helps break down the movement phase for everybody. Uh, I hope that this was a really informative video for you. As always, our Patreon tiers, Hatchlings, get $1.50, you get mentioned on the Patreons page. Firebirds, $5, you get 24-hour early access to all content and ability to vote on future content. Uh, the Phoenix, $10, you get all of the above, plus a Phoenix Gaming sticker sent to you. The Immortals get $20. Uh, at $20, get all of that plus a t-shirt sent to you, and you get special shout-outs at the end of the video. And as always, I'm going to shout-out my two immortals right now, uh, Milf Slayer 69 and then the real Donnie G. Uh, again, thank you. You guys have been invaluable. You've helped me out a lot. I've been able to, like I said, use that money to get terrain so that I can run events again and rebuild my terrain. And then also been able to get some streaming gear, stuff like that. So thanks a lot. And then again, all the links in the description. Teespring store, awesome themed merch. You guys are the best. Talk to you later.